Good evening. I want to welcome you back to our Wednesday night Bible study. We're going to uh, finish up verses 1 through 10 of chapter 20. Uh, this is a two-part. We did part one last week talking about the thousand-year millennium when Christ comes to reign on earth. I gave you three different views here talking about how people see this period, this millennium period. The first is post-millennium. And what that means is this view says that the world's going to get better and better and as the world reaches its proper stage of perfection at that moment, then Jesus Christ is going to return and set up his millennial kingdom. Here's the problem with this view here is that the world isn't getting better and better. The world's getting worse and worse each day. Wickedness that we see around us is only increasing. It's not decreasing. So that's why I put an X by this one because I don't believe this is a proper view of things that are going to take place. A lot of people believe this. That doesn't mean that I'm right. This is just means that this is, I take this last view, but I'll explain as we keep going. The next view is amillennialism. And with that, that means the primary version says there is no literal uh, millennial kingdom. It already feels like Satan has been bound. It spiritualizes these verses. And it feels like that Satan has been bound and they, we are already living in the millennial right now, that all that's taken place in Revelation has happened. The problem with this is they see Jesus as already having returned and set up this kingdom around 70 AD, and they see Satan as being bound. And let me just share with you some things, because if there's anything that we can kind of take away from this to eliminate this view, I believe, is that Satan has not been bound. Satan, it seems like these days, has been more active than he's ever been. Paul says several things in Scripture, and that's where we always go to for our basis. He says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, that Satan is the God of this world. Right now, he has access to heaven where God is. He has access to the cosmos where the planets are, and he has access to the earth where we are. And, and so we know he's not bound right now. He's still very active. It also says, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, that he is the he blinds the minds of unbelievers. He keeps them from seeing truth. Do you know anybody today that can be shown facts about the Bible and they still turn their head and say, no, I don't believe that? Well, that's because they've been blinded by the God of this world is what 2 Corinthians 4 verses 3 through 4 say. Um, also, Paul writes that he is the prince of the power of this air. Right now, as I said, he has access to three heavens. You have the heaven where God is. We know from the story of Job that Satan has access to go up there and accuse you and me of different things. He has access to the planets. He can move around. He can't be in every place at once, but he can move around. He's a supernatural uh, being in that he was created by God. Um, as an angel that has fallen and took many fallen angels with him. So he's the prince of the power of this era. That's why we see in more places, we see more demonic activity because he obviously has more reign and control in those areas. He's called the angel of light in 2 Corinthians 11. He um, energizes people to give off a false impression. That's why he's called the antichrist, to energize people to make them look like they're Christian, to make them look like they're pastors, whatever, believers, and then he, he tricks them, he deceives them in some way. And then in the famous verse that we have in 1 Peter 5, 8, says that Satan roars around, like a, um, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And so we need to keep that in mind as we're looking at this, that he hasn't been bound He's still active, if not even more active. And then that brings us to that third choice here, that premillennialism. And what this verse holds is that humanity is going to get worse and worse and continue to de degenerate into a point that they go into a literal seven-year tribulation. If you remember on our time chart here, we're in the age of grace now, the church age. And the next event is the rapture. We're waiting on that. Should that be in our generation? Then the church is taken out. And the church and the Holy Spirit are, rest are restraining the Antichrist right now. A lot of people believe that, you know, it's called the spirit of lawlessness. A lot of people believe that that's a whole movement. It's not an individual person. I personally believe that it's an individual person that will come onto the scene once the church is raptured. The world will be in chaos and the tribulation time clock will start. It's a seven year period broken into two, three and a half year periods. The first three and a half year periods, the Antichrist 
comes in and he is a fully man that is energized by Satan himself and he deceives the people into peace and sets up all these deals. And in the middle of the seven year period, he breaks the treaty with Israel and he sets himself in the third temple. That's another reason that we are not in the millennial period because the third temple has not been constructed yet. And that's part of Revelation, what the Bible says is going to take place. So that third temple has got to be set up and the Jews will be doing sacrifices in the middle of the tribulation. Uh, the Antichrist will go into that third temple and desecrate it and he will stop sacrifices and that's when the persecution will really pick up. And again, I tried to encourage you last week with some things about what's going to be important in the millennial. There's going to be peace, joy, happiness, holiness, glory, comfort, justice, fullness of knowledge, instruction, the removal of the curse from Genesis 3, sickness is removed, there will have no more ailments, the healing of the deformed, you'll have complete protection, there'll be no oppression, there'll be no immaturity, there'll be reproduction by the living people, and we'll explain that a little bit more. We'll all labor, uh, we'll all have jobs given to us that we will enjoy, there'll be economic prosperity, we will share in serving others with our labors that we do, uh, there'll be an increase of light, um, it talks about the sun getting brighter and the moon, and that will generate more crops and, and remember the curse is removed from the earth will be in a unified language no longer will you have to um, get that rosetta stone and learn different languages we'll all be speaking the same language the curse from the tower of babel will be reversed will be in unified worship so no matter what flavor you're worshiping right now whether it's baptist methodist whatever brand new claim right now, we're all going to be one. It's going to be the church of Jesus Christ, the bride of Jesus Christ. And then we will understand the fullness of the Spirit. We will be completely full at that time. So when we look at our passage here today uh, that we're going to be studying, uh, we will see some important things here that are taking place in the Bible. And I'm excited about this time. I'm excited about the millennial period because, again, this is a time where we come back down to earth. The Battle of Armageddon will have taken place after the seven-year tribulation where Israel is surrounded. Uh, the believing Jews that survived the tribulation, there will be believing Jews. They will come out of it. There will be believing Christians that come out of that. But many people that profess Christ during that tribulation period will be martyred. And... We come back with him at that time, at the end of the tribulation, at the Battle of Armageddon, we ride back on our horses. So get ready to ride a horse back in with him, and we start this millennial period, which is a thousand-year period, and that's going to be my focus tonight. So if you would, just pray with me real quick as we get started. We're going to be in Revelation 20, 1 through 10. Father, as we look at your word tonight, encourage us. Uh, today, as we inaugurated a new president uh, there's mixed feelings all around our country. There's anger on one side and joy on the other. And we need, as Christians, to speak the word of love and speak the word of kindness, uh, to not put up divisions that cause those things. So help us all to watch our words and be able to share the gospel during this time. Bless your word tonight. It's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. So if you take your Bibles, we're going to look at Revelation chapter 20. Read real quick verses 1 through 10, and then kind of go down what this is saying. It says, Then I saw an angel coming down. I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard tonight. It says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with a key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He seized the dragon and the, an the ancient serpent, who is the devil, Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, closed it, and put a seal on it so that he could no longer deceive, that's a key word, so he could no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years were completed. At that, he must be released for a short time. Verse 4, And I saw thrones, and the people seated on them were given authority to judge. And I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of God's word who um, had not worshipped the beast or his image, who had not accepted the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life, and they reigned with the Messiah for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life. I'm going to explain that. Verse 5 is very important. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were, was completed. This is the first resurrection. 
that he's talking about, John's talking about verses 1 through 4, is the first resurrection. Verse 6, blessed and holy is the one who shares in this first resurrection. The second death has no power over those, but they will be the priest of God and the Messiah, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Verse 7, when the thousand years are complete, when this thousand year period here on earth is complete, something happens. And this is what verse 7 says. When the thousand years are complete, Satan will be released from his prison and he will go out to do what? To deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea, which means they are numerous. They came up over the surface of the earth and surrounded the encampment of the saints, the beloved city, which is Jerusalem. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed them. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay, let's talk about what's going on here. In verses 1 and 2, we see a heavenly intervention here. Satan has been running loose, and we get down to the end of the battle of Armageddon. He has lost it. And so this is what's taking place. John says, I see an angel come with a big chain. And this big chain means that he lays hold, some of your versions say seized, and he takes hold of the devil. And that means when it talks about seizing someone or taking hold of someone, that means to have power over them, to be one's master. And this angel becomes the devil's master. Remember that Satan is an angel. He's a fallen angel. Um, and, but this, this angel that is sent down from heaven has a chain and he grabs hold of Satan. And he binds him with a strong chain that will remain on him for a thousand years. He puts him in this abyss. Now we've seen that word abyss. We'll talk about that in a little bit more, but Satan is bound. That's the key thing for a thousand years. So let me kind of back up and, and give you the picture here. The tribulation has ended. The battle of Armageddon has ended. And God has destroyed all the enemies. And there's been believing Jews that have come out of the tribulation that have survived. There's been a lot of believing Jews and a lot of other people that were beheaded during this time, killed during this time because of their testimony. And they were martyred and they were taken up to heaven. Well, when we come back at the Battle of Armageddon with Jesus Christ and he defeats all his enemies, the martyred saints from the tribulation period, the Old Testament saints, the the believers from uh, the day of Pentecost all the way to the rapture, they're all down here, and we come down and we set up the kingdom with Jesus for the thousand-year reign on earth. And so we're down here for a thousand years. God takes Satan, and he puts him down here. Excuse me for a minute. Should have done this a long time ago. But there's this place called the Abyss that he locks him away for a thousand years. And there's no disputing who the Bible's speaking about in these verses when it says his name. It calls him Satan, calls him the old serpent, the devil. Um, it, and those names reveal characters. Biblical names reveal, reveal character. The dragon, as a dragon, he was looking for someone to devour. We think of medieval things that um, have happened in the past, uh, mythology and stuff like that. Well, dragons were always looking for someone to devour. A serpent is seeking for someone to deceive. They're sly. And so that talks about his character again. The devil, that name means false accuser, and that's what he's been doing. He's had access, and he has access um, right now, but at this point, he loses all access when he's thrown down to earth during the seven-year tribulation period. He has no more access to God during that time. He cannot go and accuse the brethren anymore. But that's what that name means. The devil means false accuser, and he's always looking to discredit you and defame you. Um, that name Satan means adversary. He hates you. He hates everything about your faith. He hates God. He hates anything to do with God. How does he show that these days? He energizes people with that same hate that you will see people speak against and cuss God and hate the things of God. And all they are is they are filled with the energy of Satan during this time to do those things. And when he's called Satan, being our adversary, he's always seeking to defeat someone. But guess what? His day is coming when he will be defeated. One day he's going to get what's coming to him. And, you know, the devil has always enjoyed 
and been willing to engage in warfare with the saints. You know, Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 that we're to put on our, our battle gear because our fight isn't against flesh and blood. It's not against each other. It's a spiritual battle, and it's a spiritual battle against Satan himself. Satan is powerful, but he's not all-powerful. And sometimes we get that confused thinking that him and God are going back and forth and one day he wins and one day God, no. Um, he is allowed to do so many things on this earth right now because we have free wills. You have a free will to do right and to do wrong. Everybody has that same decision that they have to make. And Satan deceives people and he thinks, he tricks them into thinking that his way, Satan's way, is the way they ought to go into sin and, and moral lifestyles and hurting people and saying negative things about people. But people have a choice to not do those things. Only God can claim that title of all-powerful and all-knowing. So that's what we see in the first couple of verses. In verse 3, we see him being incarcerated, that this angel removes the devil for a thousand years and imagine a world with no devil. Imagine never being tempted. Imagine all the evilness that we're seeing right now. And I'm, like I said, I know our country's um, divided right now with a lot of hatred and, and different things, uh, ideologies that are going on. And that's really what the battle is right now. The battle is a battle of, between ideologies, of moral compass that we as Christians should have and have against a world that is blinded by the enemy and wanting to push the devil's agenda onto the world and do the things of the devil, like abortion, like, you know, the things that we are seeing of the, the progressive side that wants to do all these things that are totally contradictory to the Bible and, and to the character of a Christian. And so after the angel removes Satan for a thousand years, there will be no one uh, to uh, tempt people to do evil. You won't be tempted during this time to ever do evil. There'll be no one to whisper lies in the ears of our mind anymore. All lies will be wiped away. There'll be no one to remind us of our past and all the mistakes we've had. There'll be no one to set traps for us uh, that we will fall into. And it will be a world without the devil and it's going to be a wonderful place. Right now we go through daily struggles you know, but what a wonderful place the world is going to be without the devil involved in it. And we will enjoy that for a thousand years. He'll, he'll be let loose. We'll talk about that in a second. But without the devil, there's going to be peace. There's going to be prosperity, joy, holiness, and blessing. And we will, um, it will just be the order of every day. Every day is going to be a joy to live with our Savior during that time. So while the earth rejoices in his absence... The devil will be getting a small taste of what's uh, going to be his eternity. Now, he isn't sent to the abyss to punish him. He's sent so the scripture says that he won't be able to deceive anyone for a period of time. That's why he's been locked away, is that he won't be able to deceive anyone during this period of time. And he's put into what they call a bottomless pit, which is this abyss that we're talking about. And we saw the abyss in Revelation 9. That it talked about it was open during one of the plagues and when it opened terrible tormenting demons came out of that place and tormented the people on earth but this seems to be an ancient prison that the book of jude talks about jude 6 talks about that the demonic demons i think from genesis um, uh, during the book of genesis when they cohabited cohabitated with people on earth they were locked away at this time well they're released during the tribulation period and that's the dungeon that I believe Satan is put back into. Um, it's, it's this pit when it's opened uh, during Revelation 9. Terrible, terrible things come out of there. But remember, Satan will be locked up for a thousand years. What will Satan do for a thousand years? Um, he will serve his time knowing that this season is short to him. A thousand years is really nothing in, in, in Satan's eyesight and in God's eyesight. But what will we be doing? We'll be rejoicing because we know that he is locked down for those days. So we see that this, there's a prophecy here in Revelation 20 verses 1 through 3 about Satan, involving Satan and what's going to happen to him. Verses 4 through 6, we see a prophecy involving the saints. We shift from Satan being locked down here into the abyss, 
going into, let's talk about the saints. What does verses 4 through 6 say? It says, Then I saw the thrones and the people seated on them, and they were given authority to judge. And I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus, because of God's word, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, who had not accepted the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with the Messiah for a thousand years. Verse 5 says, The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years was completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over these, but they will be priest of God and the Messiah, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So let's talk about this prophecy involving the saints here. Verse 4a, the very first part of verse 4a says this. It says, Then I saw thrones and people seated on them who were given authority to judge. So the saints are given here as a picture reigning with Christ. They're coming, there's going to come a day when they will reign and rule with the Redeemer. Okay? That day is coming when those that made their way through the tribulation period, those that were that were martyred during the tribulation period, then all the saints from the Old Testament all the way forward will come and reign with Christ during this time. Let me kind of remind you of the events leading all up to this moment. Um, remember, when we got to this point, we're in the church age, then we hit the rapture point. That's the next thing on God's timeline. There's nothing else that needs to take place for that rapture to happen. It can happen at any moment of time because this is what we believe. I believe in this millennialism, the premillennialism, that the world will get worse, and as the world gets worse, it will enter into a literal tribulation period where the church will be raptured out prior to that, There'll be a seven-year tribulation period, and then the millennial period will take place at the end of that. So, what happens? Let's review again that we've talked about. We've, we've gone through these many weeks ago, and I just want to remind you of, of what's coming for us as believers. Jesus will return in the clouds above the earth at the rapture. So, again, we're in the church age. It says, at that moment... The dead in Christ will rise first. So those that have died before us, their bodies will be raised. Their souls are in heaven right now. Their souls and the Old Testament saints will come down in the clouds with Jesus. They'll be up in the atmosphere. And it says the dead in Christ will rise first. And then those who are alive and remain shall be caught up, shall be raptured up is the word. So whoever's alive during this generation of the rapture, they'll be called up to heaven in the clouds with Jesus, with those that have passed away, and they'll go to heaven for seven years during this tribulation period. So that's the first event. And while up in heaven, these things take place. Um, he will take his bride home to heaven, and that's when the tribulation kicks off, the seven-year period broken into two, three-and-a-half-year periods. We will face the judgment seat, those that go up to heaven during that time. It's called the Bema seat. And again, if you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, in your life, you can look on a timeline. Your judgment for your sins was passed on to him on the cross when you received him as Lord and Savior. So this judgment seat is called the Bema seat. It's more of an awards ceremony. How faithful were you with the life and the gifts that he gave you during this time? You will be given crowns based on that to lay at Jesus' feet. So that's a, like I said, it's more of an awards ceremony than a judgment. But yes, you will be held accountable for things that you said and did and didn't do while you were down here. The next is the marriage supper of the Lamb, where his bride, it's a symbolic symbol of, of Christ calling his bride, the church up, and then becoming one up in heaven. Then the church and all those uh, Old Testament saints return for the battle of Armageddon and we watch, we don't do anything, we ride our horses back at the end of the seven-year period and we watch uh, Jesus Christ defeat the enemies and then he establishes his new kingdom. That's the millennial years. He establishes new kingdom on earth with all those that have made it through the tribulation and those that have been martyred and then the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints, we all come down here, Satan is locked away and he establishes his new kingdom on earth and it, we reign with him for a thousand years. And so that's going to be an exciting time. And, and in verse 4, the second part of it, it makes mention of another group that's going to be there with us. And he says, And I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus 
and because of God's word, and who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and who had not received the mark on their forehead. So the reason they were there is they didn't deny their testimony. They never received the mark. Um, they, they followed Christ all the way to the end. They were even killed. They're resurrected at this time, and they endured the horrors of the tribulation period without tarnishing their testimony for Jesus Christ, and they didn't deny their faith during all that opposition. You know, people are so easy today to, to be scared to speak out about Jesus. These people didn't. Even in the face of death, they didn't. So let's talk a little bit more about these tribulation saints. Some of them, as I said, died during the, the um, tribulation period, and they went up to heaven waiting for the tribulation to be over. Others made it out alive. They were allowed then to enter into the millennium at that time, uh, celebrating their survival. All the tribulation saints will join the bride of Christ for a thousand years down here. And Daniel 9.27 tells us that the Old Testament saints will also be there as well, which is exciting. If you're a history buff, if you enjoy the Old Testament, you're going to be walking elbow to elbow uh, with those folks from the Old Testament uh, during this thousand year period and it's going to be exciting. I just want you to kind of close your eyes and imagine some things. Imagine a world where there's no devil, no evilness. You know, we want that so bad. We, we see horrible things happening every day and we hear about horrible things, but imagine a world with no devil. There's not going to be any evil things going on. Imagine a world filled with redeemed saints from Pentecost to rapture. There's no evilness in the world, so there's no evilness inside of these people because there's no flesh. Imagine a world where the saints of the tribulation uh, that have survived it will be living and will hear the stories and the testimonies that they've had. Imagine a world where you wake up and walk down the streets and you'll see King David and you'll see Paul and you'll see Jesus and you'll see Moses and Ezra and Habakkuk and Isaiah, and Jeremiah, and Moses, you just, Abraham, you, you just think of all the folks that we've read about. Uh, you will be rubbing elbows with them on those streets, and they will know you as you know yourself. Verses 5 and 6 talk about the saints and his resurrection, you know, and here's the deal. There's a lot of people that just believe in one general resurrection. The Bible clearly teaches two resurrections, and I want to make that very clear. Some believe, as I said, in this general re revelation where there's one or uh, general resurrection where there's everybody's raised at once. The sheep, which are the saved, go to heaven. The goats, which are the lost, the Bible talks about, go to hell. But it's divided, actually, and I want to make that very clear. That Luke 14, 14, if you want to write these down, you can go back and look. Luke 14, 14. John 5, 29, Philippians 3, 10 through 14, um, talk about the two different distinct re uh, resurrections that are going to take place. What we're talking about here in this passage, especially in verses 5 and 6, is the first resurrection here. And this occurs at Jesus' second coming. This, When he raptures the church, that's not his second coming because he doesn't come fully to earth. When he comes down at the end at the Battle of Armageddon to set up his kingdom, that is the true second coming okay of jesus christ and it includes the saints um, that were raised at the rapture as well as those that were resurrected at the end of the tribulation period and those part of the first resurrection are called blessed you know why they're called blessed is they will not have to endure the second death it says so what happens to people that die that don't know jesus christ in the age of grace or in the tribulation period they die what happens to them they are left in hell at that moment, okay? They haven't been judged yet. At the end of the thousand-year period, that's when the second resurrection will take place, okay? And I'll explain a little bit more. So they, these people that will be facing the second resurrection are those that have rejected Jesus Christ, um, whether during this age of grace or earlier or during the tribulation period. Um, they will be facing what they call the judgment called the great white throne. And that is one where they will be shown the evidence that they were given an opportunity to get saved and they never chose to. And they will spend eternity in the lake of fire. The se second resurrection are those, again, who have rejected Jesus Christ 
and they'll be raised for this great white throne judgment at the end of the millennial period, okay? And all those will be cast into the lake of fire for eternity. So at the end of the thousand years, God has the second resurrection for the lost, and he pulls the, uh, Satan himself out of the abyss, and he throws him into the lake of fire to suffer for eternity forever and ever, and then those that are in hell, he pulls up and he, he brings them in front of the great white throne judgment, and they're cast into the lake of fire. They're tormented forever and ever and ever. Let's talk about the last three verses here, 7 and 10, 7 through 10. It says this, because it talks about something happening. So we're enjoying this thousand-year period. Everything's great. And then it says, after the thousand-year period, God does something strange to us. He releases Satan. He's been bound for a thousand years in this abyss, and he releases him. It says, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to do what? To deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. The number is like the sand of the sea. And they came up over the surface of the earth and surrounded in the encampment of the saints, the below city. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed them. Verse 10, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So we see Satan and his freedom here. After the thousand years, he's let loose for this period of time, and Satan is turned uh, out, of, out of prison, and a lot of people ask the question, why? Well, if you can tell me why he was released the first time, you probably can tell me why he was released the second time. I don't know, um, but there's a reason for it, because verse 3 says he must be loosed. He must be let loose for a period of time, and here's kind of my conclusion on it. I'm not saying this is 100% it. This is just kind of what I'm drawing from. Um, we'll never fully understand why, but there's some reasons to consider here. And here's a couple of things to consider. Even after God, he's doing something. Because remember, entering into this millennial period, there's people that didn't get their glorified bodies that came out of the tribulation. They're still in their flesh and blood bodies. Okay? And because they're in their flesh and blood bodies, they're allowed to marry and they are allowed to have children. And because there's no curse on the earth, the population on the earth is going to skyrocket. Well, any child born during the millennial period is going to be born with a sin nature. Um, outwardly, they will not rebel because it won't be tolerated. Inwardly, they will be rebelling because their hearts are wicked. And they're still going to need to get saved. Those born during the millennial period. Um, will need to be saved the same way we are today, through the blood of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice. And I think what this does, when he lets loose of Satan for this time, and it says that he deceives those during the period, God is proving some things. You know, the first it proves is that the devil, it, he's unreformable, okay? Even though, and he's unrepentant, even after God has proved to him over and over multiple times that he's stronger with him and any time he goes up against God, God wipes him clean. Um, all his plans are thwarted against God, yet he still defies God, no matter what. No matter how much he sees um, God in control of everything, he still attacks his plans. The second thing we'll show, uh, we first showed how depraved the devil is. He'll never change. The second is we see how depraved mankind is. The Bible says in Romans 3.10 that there's no one righteous, no, not one. So here you have people that are showing that they cannot live the perfect life. Even though they're in the perfect world at this time, they cannot uh, do anything on their own. And matter of fact, the Bible says if we're left to ourselves, if mankind is left to themselves, we will always stray away from God. Have you noticed that in our lives? When we get away from God, it's because we're trying to do things on our own. And that's what he's saying here. In verses 8 and 9, it talks about Satan and his forces. Where is he going to get this vast army that's going to rise up? Well, again, these are the people, the children that were born during this millennial period. That, As I said, there's no poverty. There's no disease. There's no war. It's a perfect world. Why would anyone fall for the devil's lies the minute he's let out? Because inside of us, we all have a fallen nature. And um, some of the believing Jews and, and some of the tribulation saints 
um, they will enter into this period in their flesh and blood bodies. We, coming from heaven, we will have our new redeemed bodies and souls. And so because they enter the millennial period in their flesh and blood, um, they will marry and they will have children, as I said, um, because of perfect health during this time and perfect living conditions, the population, again, is going to skyrocket. And children born in this millennium will be um, in a perfect environment, but yet they will still rebel. Every one of those little children will be born with a sin nature that needs to be dealt with. And they'll have every opportunity. They'll be seeing Jesus face to face. They'll be living among characters of the Bible that we read about. They'll be living among the glorified saints and right in their presence, but yet they're still going to want to rebel. They'll keep the rules during the millennial period only because it says Jesus is going to rule with an iron rod. They'll only do that because they're forced to. But in their hearts, they still need a Savior because they're sinners and they've still got rebellion inside of them. And so in verses 9 and 10, Satan makes one last ruha of trying to raise up this army and leads them to a final assault against Jesus. And what God does, God himself ends this battle. And what he does is he rains down fire from heaven and he totally destroys the people and the rebels. And Satan himself at that time is cast into the lake of fire to spend eternity tormented with the Antichrist and the false prophet. And here's the way the, the story ends. God wins. Uh, this boils down to one question. Whose side are you on? Are you on God's side or are you on Satan's side? And right now it looks like Satan's winning with all the, the craziness in our world, but you need to understand God wins in the end. He always does, and he always has, and he's predicted these things. And every time we look through Scripture, we see more and more things being checked off at this time. Folks, our world's being set up for the Antichrist just to step right in and the church to be raptured out. I hope that you're right with Jesus Christ. If you've never asked him to be your Lord and Savior, repent of your sins, ask him to forgive you of your sins, to come into your heart and into your life to be your Lord and Savior. Be encouraged that one of these days, all this that we've gone through is going to be, as Paul says, it's just light of affliction. Uh, the glory awaits us. And I hope you are enjoying uh, this time as we prepare for our millennial, our eternity with the King Jesus. Father, thank you again for your word, and we thank you for the power of it, and we thank you for the victory in it, that no matter what we go through down here, we have hope, we have promises from you that you are going to uh, win in the end, and because we're on your side, we win too. Thank you for that. I just pray for those that don't know you that their eyes would be opened and that the God of this world wouldn't blind them any longer. Let them see you. Let us witness to them. Let us love on them. Be kind and show them the way to the cross. It's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen.